I'm Michelle, I'm in regulatory, and this is Nick, and Nick is an expert in reimbursement. Nick and I work together, but again, we are on kind of opposite ends of the spectrum of bringing a device to market. Michelle, on one hand, lives in a fully furnished home, and uh, <laughs> Nick, what's going on here? Yeah, we're we're moving. It seems right like after we this call, you're going to pick up those boxes and carefully place ukuleles. Yes, yeah. <laughs> those are full size guitars. This room's just huge. Oh, okay. Those are really far away. <clears throat> no, we um, we're moving. We we're getting a different place a few miles from here, and moving day is Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday next week. So, do you need a little bit more space these days? Yeah, we're having because. a we're having another puppy in a month a human puppy, so we need a little bit more room. Um, and we don't they, know what it is yet, people, so don't ask me. We don't know. We like the surprise. We've done that with all of our other kids and keeping with that tradition. So to answer Michelle's question, um, you know, what what is regulatory to a reimbursement guy? I've said this, and let me say something very forcefully at the top of this meeting is that, um, how do I say this? Regulatory for me it may as well be a different, in a different galaxy. It doesn't make any difference as far as reimbursement is concerned, other than essentially a box check. Are you FDA cleared or FDA approved? Have you gone through the appropriate regulatory bodies like CLIA, if you're a diagnostic test, laboratory developed test? that in that regard, I am more than comfortable if somebody comes to me and says, well, Nick, I've got a 510K product. Uh, we did class two or we're a PMA or we're a laboratory developed test or whatever. You know, what, what do you think? And I go, I don't know, go talk to Michelle. I'll do exactly what Joe does and say, I, I'm not a re regulatory guy. So you could think of regulatory and reimbursement running in parallel because there is a lot that you can do that would appeal to payers at the same time that you can do things that would appeal to the FDA. But <clears throat> as far as I'm concerned, I, I frankly don't know the last time I asked a company their regulatory status. It just doesn't make any difference for most reimbursement. Now, Medicare, you know, we can talk about some details, but but I'm already making the assumption, you've already spoken with Michelle, you've already got regulatory clearance, or you're going to in the next 12 months or whatever it is, but really it doesn't make any difference as far as I'm concerned with, with strict reimbursement. So I think, Michelle, during this, I might double talk a little bit, because it, you can't get reimbursement, and it wouldn't matter even if you did, if you didn't have FDA approval clearance. It's right. kind of like, it's a, by the time people get to you, it's a foregone conclusion that they've gone through uh, yes. the regulatory path. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would say, I mean, I, I still get people that will say, you know, Nick's a regulatory expert. And it'll sound like, I think some people get, you know, reimbursement and regulatory mixed up, which is the purpose of this conference today. And I'm like, I don't know hardly anything about regulatory. I mean, I know enough, like they say, to be dangerous. I, you know, I know class two versus a class three, you know, I, that type of stuff. But that's not my world. That's Michelle's. So. And then vice versa, I know enough about reimbursement to know when my clients are talking crazy. And I'm like, I, I, I know enough to say, well, I, I, that's not how it works. Talk to Nick. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're, we're hoping to dispel some, some common myths. Um, here today. This is the part where I interject how happy I am because I think you guys met through me. Uh, that is true. And we also need to call out the appearance of Michelle's Lean RAQA mug. I've never seen that before. I don't know where you got that idea. Cheers. Uh, I, I hired this marketing guy that's pretty mm -hmm. smart. Mm-hmm. Those of you on the call who don't have your own branded mugs, what are you waiting for? We're on camera all the time. Michelle, take it away. So, so Nick, um, let's talk codes. In, in my world, there is a product code, which is a three-letter code that already exists from the FDA, and you have to find which 
of these product codes best describe your product and its intended use. Now, on, on rare occasion, you can have more than one product code if you're combining existing technologies and you're not creating new risks or new intended uses. But I, I have customers that think the product code that they choose for the FDA somehow is linked or informs their reimbursement in their next steps. And they, are, they have dictated to me, like, oh, Michelle, I don't want to use that product code, even though it's not only the best fit, but the easiest regulatory path. Because they're like, no, I want a de novo so that I can say I'm this brand new thing and, and get a new code. And at that point, they're not talking about reimbursement. They're, 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 they're trying to make the link between how they got FDA clearance to what they're going to be eligible for in reimbursement. And then I've also seen people say, oh, I looked up devices that were cleared under this code, and I don't like how they're reimbursed, so I'm not going to let you submit a 510K under that. And I'm like, that's not a thing. No, you're exactly right. So, um, again, I don't know. I mean, I've had... When I say consulting, I mean, that could be anywhere from a little 20-minute phone call all the way through a big engagement or something, hundreds of companies. And I've never once asked them what their regulatory product code was so that I could best assess what their reimbursement strategy should be. That, like I said, they're in, they're in semi-different universes. So let's say that a company comes to you, Michelle, and they get a 510K um, de novo, whatever it is, you know, you, again, I don't even know the vernacular, you would know that better. And you say, guys, here's what you are. I just called the FDA. We did all the stuff. We did the trial that the FDA would require for this distinction. And you're good to go. As far as the FDA is concerned, you can start marketing your, your product. And if that company did, and many, many, many of them do, um, they're going to hit a brick wall first with coding, our code, <clears throat> excuse me, CPT, DRG, ICD-10, HICPICS, uh, APC groupers, you know, all, all of the reimbursement coding world, then they're going to hit a brick wall with coverage, and then they're going to hit a brick wall with payment, possibly, right? I'm, I'm going to give a, a verbose example here, but when they come to me, the first thing I would say is, okay, let's talk about coding. What codes do you think you're going to use? Well, if they have this new medical device, some new, you know, stent or catheter or whatever this thing is, I'm going to say, okay, tell me about it. How is it used? And they say, well, we're going to sell this to the hospital. Um, the hospital is going, all the physicians in the cardiology unit are going to use it. They implant it in the patient's neck. The bill goes to that patient's insurance company. And by the way, there's already a CPT code for this. And I go, no, there's a CPT code for the implantation of a device in a patient's carotid artery. And they go, yeah, we're, we're, that's what we are. And I say, yes, but is that code set up to reimburse for your product? Because an insurance company is going to say, yeah, we know about it, carotid artery stenting, but we know about Smith & Nephews and Boston Scientifics and Medtronics, you know, St. Jude's device, not yours. Yours is brand new. And secondly, do you have a HICPICS code? HCPCS, that's how we're going to get reimbursed for buying your thing, not just for implanting it. CPT code is for the procedure. HICPICS code is for the device to get reimbursed for the purchase of the, the actual unit. And so, uh, Michelle, you and I have talked about this. The, the strategy in which a company should go about getting a HICPICS code is crucially important. So I was involved with a company a while ago. We ended up getting a HICPICS code. And in my mind, under the assumption that in parallel with getting the new HICPICS code, so that when the physician spends $100 on this, they can bill and get reimbursed for this, not just for the implantation of it, that the clinical trials we were going to do at the same time the HICPICS code application was going to go through would be done at the same time. Forgive the terrible grammar in that. You have to get a HICPICS code. Well, that's a plenty of time to get a clinical trial going so that when you are granted the new code by CMS, you have the evidence that warrants the reimbursement of that code. 
Um, if you don't need a HIC code, don't get one. And there's rationale about how you go about choosing whether or not you need a new product code. But I hear that stuff all the time where companies will say, you know, it, we're good, we already have a code. Well, no, Smith and Nephew and Boston Scientific and those guys that have done the research to show that that code is worth reimbursing, they've done the work, but you haven't. You're a brand new product. So an insurance company will have that code, either a CPT or HICPIX code or whatever, in a big book of uh, HICPIX codes, HICPIX level one or level two, and they're going to take each of those codes and they're going to set it up in their system as covered, possibly covered, or not covered. And when your product code comes through, excuse me, let me use, when your HICPIX code comes through, sorry, Michelle, that on that, when that happens, <clears throat> excuse me, the insurance company is going to say, well, what is this? And they're going to say, oh, it's the Nick Anderson carotid artery stint. And they go, we've never heard of that. This is set up to be covered for the Medtronic, Smith & Nephew, and Boston Scientific stint, but not the Nick Anderson stint. He hasn't done the work. Denied. And then the bill goes back through the system and everyone gets mad at you because you didn't do the proper studies to warrant reimbursement for that code. So I don't know if I made that any clearer or any, any dirtier, but it, it's the Just product scarier. code you get from Michelle and the reimbursement code that Nick will help you navigate, two totally entirely different things, and one doesn't have a bearing on the other. You get your scarier and more expensive. Say that again, Joe, sorry? You just, you, you didn't make it murkier, you made it scarier and more expensive. Yeah, yeah, I mean, not to sound pejorative, but welcome to MedTech. I mean, you, you've got to go sit down with Michelle and she's going to say, okay, tell me what you got. And I'll say, I have this thing, and it goes up through the femoral artery into here and does this and this and this. And she'll go, great. I, I have a schematic in my brain of what you're going to need to do to get the FDA to say, yes, you can now begin marketing your product. Then after that, you or during that, you should go talk with Nick and Nick's team and Nick's friends and all that. And we're going to help you figure out, okay, fine. If, if Michelle said you're a PMA, fine, you're a PMA. What did Michelle tell you you need to do for clinical trials? And they'll say, she told us about 100 patients uh, in a cohort study. And I'll say, oh, it's going to be enough for reimbursement. Because that might be enough to get the FDA to, to sign, a, you know, letting you go to market. But that might not be enough for Cigna and Aetna and Blue Cross, who are your customers. And getting reimbursement is not a universal, I'm reimbursable. It's... I'm reimbursable here, here, and here, but these guys said no. I don't. Ex I can't explain it, and I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, so depending on your product, if your product is primarily in a disease that is the Medicare population, 65 and older type product, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, whatever, then without a doubt, your primary customer is going to be Medicare. Well, that's a different game. we got to play that game. How do we get you a local coverage determination with Noridian and Novitas and CGS and WPS and FCSO and all of that? How do we get you a national coverage determination so you're covered across the entire United States for Medicare? Well, then we have to talk about commercial payers. Now we got to go to Aetna, then we have to go to Cigna, then we have to go to BCPS. You confused me there when you said... 65 plus Medicare, isn't Medicare a guy to convince? You just mentioned like 10 other names that I haven't heard of. I know. When everybody on this call, when you get a minute, go to Google and type in CMS space MAC map, M-A-P, Medicare CMS map, and um, Mac, Mac map, excuse me. So these MACs are private companies. I don't know how many people know this. Medicare is uh, adjudicated by 12 private companies. So it's not the government in Washington, D.C. when Nick Ander, well, when my grandfather's claim comes through and it goes to the government, it's not that. It goes to a private company. Since I live in Utah, I'm in the Noridian Medicare group. Uh, if you live in Florida, you're in the FCSO group. And if you're in the U.S. Virgin Islands, you're in the FCSO group. So a physician 
in Miami that treats a Medicare patient, that bill will go to FCSO. And, and a medical director at FCSO is going to say, wait, what is this thing? I've never heard of intracarotid stenting for an 80-year-old with asymptomatic, you know, whatever. <clears throat> then they'll do a health technology assessment, and that one payer group, just FCSO, which is Florida and the U.S. Virgin Islands, they will determine if Medicare is going to reimburse for that, just for that jurisdiction. Well, that's one jurisdiction. Now, it's a big one. Most Medicare patients live in Florida. But you've got to go rinse and repeat that 10 other times, 11 other times in each jurisdiction of Medicare across the United States. Unless you can get a national coverage determination, an NCD, one big blanket one. But that's major. To get an NCD is very, very difficult. And if you're a screening or diagnostic test, it's even harder. That's just Medicare. That's just Medicare. Medicare. I'm going to say two, three things. One is shout out to Rick who found that link. I just shared it with everybody. Uh, and second is we better talk a little Michelle stuff because the questions are coming in fast and furious about reimbursement. I mean, yeah, I mean, they taste great together. Mm -hmm. It's more of like the peanut butter and she's more the chocolate, I think. <laughs> That's my energy. So, um, I, I want to back up a little bit because you, you mentioned uh, evidence and data a, a, a couple of different times. Um, and we talk about this a lot together, is it, the point of the FDA and any data that the FDA is going to ask for, it's purely to demonstrate safety and efficacy and clinical benefit. It has nothing to do with a reimbursement model with a healthcare economy, with anything that you need to prove to any of these payer organizations that Nick talked about. So I have had customers that are so in love with their own science and technology, they have been just blind and are shocked that the FDA even asked for like a small 20, 50 patient study. And then they think that, um, that okay, they got, that. The, Okay, if they're having trouble swallowing that the FDA wants to see data on 20 patients, what do you think the reimbursement guys are going to ask for? Yeah. I mean, it, it, it may be orders of magnitude different than proving safety and efficacy. And supposedly, there, in 2011, FDA opened up a new pathway to kind of try to parallel path technology with, uh, where you start the conversation with FDA and CMS simultaneously so that you build a study that can hopefully uh, kill two birds with one stone. But I've heard very little out of that pilot program um, since it started. And, uh, and again, you're trying to prove two, two very different things, so it's very hard to build those same outcomes into a single, a single study. Something you said uh, that made me think. It sounds to me as though FDA doesn't care how stupid your idea is as long as it doesn't hurt people and is safe. Correct. So you can get something approved that has okay. no chance of commercialization. Make sure you have some kind of clinical benefit, that there's an actual need. Yeah, I get that. But they might say, you know, there are 10 other guys doing this. Then I don't care. They won't say that specifically. but. They don't even. They, they they have no interest in your commercialization plan. If your device makes sense, if anybody will pay for it, that that's not in their wheelhouse at all. You know the example that I give, Joe. I've given this during the 10x Med Device Conference. That I'll talk about. You know how many of us, when we go buy a new car. We go down to the car dealership and we see a new Toyota Corolla and we look at the sticker in the window and it says 29, uh, 29 highway and 25 city MPG. How many of us actually believe that? And what I end up, you know, it's funny because I've asked groups worldwide that question, you know, and it's like you know, whatever the equivalent of a sticker is in Dubai, but I'm like everyone has these in the car window and none of us believe them. My house right here is at 4,800 feet altitude that I have a car seat in there. I have my windows rolled down with my air conditioning on. Um, you know, I, I have drag because the windows are down, on and on and on. 
there's not a rat's chance I'm going to get 29 mpg on the freeway. I'm going to get 25, 24 maybe. Um, that I take that sticker in the window as just kind of a baseline idea and then I discount it for where I live. If I lived at sea level and I didn't have a car seat and I never rolled down my windows with the air conditioning on, that'd be a different story. Well, that's the EPA. It's the, it's the car equivalent of the FDA in humans. And literally how they do that, how they determine this, is they take your car and they put it on rollers. They make Toyota do it. They blow a fan at 65 miles per hour at the radiator. And they turn on the car and they collect the exhaust out the back and so on and so forth. And that's how they determine miles per gallon. That is not what we would call in health economics and reimbursement and all this real world evidence. It's not. That's an FDA trial. So when Michelle says, you need to go do 10 patients, and here's what that will look like. Uh, Michelle, I don't know if you design those types of studies or if there's some framework, but you say, guys, I think you're going to need to do 10 patients. That is in the most uh, 65 mile an hour fan blowing on a roller that I can think of in the medical world. And then I take that and I go, guys, that's fine. If that's what you needed to do to get, re to get regulatory, now let's go do a systematic literature review, a big $50,000 project. Let's go pull all the literature and let's see what's actually getting reimbursement. Oh, lo and behold, it's not 10 patients. It's 7,000 prospective over 36 months. You know, that's a big difference from what the FDA needed to see. Um, you know, all of us, when we go buy a car, you go to Edmonds, you go to Car and Driver because you want to see the real world evidence, the RWE. You want to see how that Toyota Corolla actually performs on the road and with an actual driver, with actual wind, with the windows down in a car seat and obese and everything. That's what I want to see when I go buy a new car. So it's, it, it, is, it is a very good analogy for the difference between the clinical trials that you would have to do to get regulatory, FDA, EPA approval, versus what you have to do to get Edmonds and car and driver, meaning Cigna and Aetna, to sign off and say, hey, now we're talking. You guys actually took this device out of the perfectly perfect, perfect FDA trial world, and you went and did it with a CRO, a contract research organization. You went and did it in 900 patients, prospective, randomized over five years, and you showed extraordinary outcomes. That's real world evidence. I encourage everyone on the call now to type in the word applause for Nick because you are the best analogy giver I know. Seriously, you have an analogy for everything and you make it so easy to understand. So thank you. On behalf of the office, applause, applause, applause. <laughs> they love you, Nick. No, thank you. They have a couple you. offers here of helping you move, actually. So people well, hey. know they can help you move. I'll take, I'll take any help we can get. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't, I, I got to say this again, that does not detract from what you have to do with Michelle. And if nobody, nobody's board of directors is going to say, okay, Michelle, what do you think? And Michelle says 10 patients and they go, great, let's do a thousand. You know, everyone wants the bare minimum. Let's just check the FDA box. Let's get that over with. Then we'll deal with Nick Anderson and his payer shenanigans. Um, and I can't fault companies for that. At least you got FDA clearance. The share price goes from a dollar a share to $4 a share instantaneously, even though you're still not ready to go to market, even though legally you can. So I'm not saying if Michelle tells you 10 patients in your study that she's wrong. No, Michelle is playing in that perfect world, right? Michelle, that's, you're telling them the correct thing. Let Nick go do his thing. I'm doing my thing for regulatory. Yeah. We have our uh, first contestant on the Nick and Michelle show. It's Jonathan Saul. His mic is open. His camera is not. Hi, John. Good morning. Hi. Well, so I have a couple questions. Um, I, I appreciate the analogy, but I would love to hear a story about somewhere uh, or some time where the two of you work together with a product uh, or device um, that achieved that success, that went directly to the thousand person 
um, alignment uh, because they had either the capital to do that or they had the foresight to say it's worth uh, making those steps um, in advance. And then the other thing that I was hoping to understand is just to have some kind of framework to uh, interpret pricing um, in, in the form of reimbursement, just to have a very 50,000 foot level comprehension of how reimbursement works um, from, a, from a price tier standpoint. And is, is there anything in the regulatory stance, for example, like let's say you're um, uh, moderate uh, complexity CLIA versus point of care that makes the work between the two of you very, very valuable for a company. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I can give you, I, I don't have an example off the top of my head of one with me and Michelle together, but I have an example that I think most people on this call will understand. I think it'll still answer your question. How ColoGuard came to market. So um, I don't, I'm not a ColoGuard fan. I think ColoGuard incentivizes healthy people that should be getting colonoscopies to wait till they get cancer. Bad idea. That's a great tagline. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know that they'll ever put it on their website or commercials, but um, that's essentially what it's doing. You're 50 years old and you should be getting a colonoscopy but you're not going to, and you're at you know, moderate to high risk for colon cancer, you're gonna wait till you have blood in your stool, and then you're gonna go find out that you could have got a polyp removed a year ago, but you waited until it turned into cancer. I'm not a fan of ColoGuard, I'm sorry, but they're an $11 billion company, they're doing something right, whether I like their product or not. Well, I'm, I just did some research for somebody the other day, and I think what we found is that they did the small study that the FDA required, at the exact same time they did a 9,800 patient prospective study, and they were published within like three months of each other. So what they did is they essentially, in so many words, talked to Michelle, and Michelle said, you need to do 483 patients, or whatever the number was, I can't remember. And then they talked to Nick, and Nick goes, you need to do 9,900 patients to get reimbursement. And they go, great, we'll do both. Now, I would love to say that Michelle and I were the ones that in charge of ColoGuard, but, but I'm, I'm very confident that's what they did. I, I have, in fact, this afternoon for this particular client, I got to go do some additional research on that. But I think that's what they did is, Michelle, what do you want? Great, we'll go give that to you. Nick, what do you want? And let's go run those two things at the same time because what's going to get us regulatory may not get us reimbursement. Do you think that this process of what you just described is going to happen more and more as the direct to consumer model starts to expand into the healthcare system. Yeah, and I, digital health is the thing you know for direct to consumer that's leading all of this. And uh, one of the things that I have a hard time with with pure digital health is it's still trying to get reimbursed. And you know I've got a list of of examples where sometimes you can't avoid it. The digital health thing must be reimbursed. That is who the customer is. But I also go, man, if you're, if you're, if the point of your technology is to take a patient from having to go to the physician's office and letting them do this at home, don't try to get reimbursed. Just sell that on aisle five at Walmart. You know, just go direct to consumer. Sell it for $19.99 on TV. Um, you don't need Nick Anderson to do that, and you'll thank yourself if you don't need me. It, it's I'm going to have you spend millions and spend years, you know, doing all this stuff. Michelle, do you, did you have a comment too? I'm totally I did. So, so John, to, to, to your point on the, the regulatory side, you know, many of you know I, I make the joke or the analogy of myself to a, a grief counselor, and I'm the regulatory grief counselor. Um, most of my clients are startups and are in very early stages, and they're still in that that they're still playing in the denial and anger phase of what it's going to really take to bring their their product to market, not just with the FDA, but with the, the reimbursement strategy. So unfortunately, most of my clients have been so narrow-minded narrow 
in, in terms of regulatory and reimbursement, but so in love with their, their science, their technology, and this is the next best thing to med tech since sliced bread, that, um, that, 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 that they just aren't thinking this strategically early on to be able to really properly parallel path all, all of this at the same time. So that, that makes me think when you have the, the opposite, where you have very business-focused uh, clients and they're saying, Nick, am I going to make more money getting reimbursement or am I going to get more money trying to get through some hurdles that Michelle can help me with so that I can hit the consumer market and be in every Walmart and CVS in the in the world, uh, you know, is are you starting to see more and more of those types of discussions? Yeah, and in fact, I, just an email this morning before I joined this call, I got one. A company that has a very uh, direct to consumer product that could very super high tech. They just raised a ton of money a couple of weeks ago. And that could be a discussion to have with them is saying, do you guys really want reimbursement? Do you really want to play this game of hick pick, CPT, randomized prospective nonsense for a product that you could sell tomorrow with Michelle's blessing at aisle six at Walgreens? What? If you can do that, now you might make this much instead of this much, but you can make this much today. Um, and just one point to that, to where the regulatory and reimbursement strategy would, would overlap when you're trying to move from a, to a direct-to-consumer model, you know, uh, one thing that the, the FDA considers OTC a change in indications for use. And if your product, co pro your FDA product code isn't already indicated for OTC use, you may be getting yourself into a situation where you have to do with other 510K um, and usability studies to demonstrate that a lay person can walk up to a shelf in the Walgreens, buy your device, and use it properly without hurting themselves and without the supervision of a, a physician or a clinician. Joe, so can I answer Jonathan's last question real quick before we go into it? So you asked about pricing. So I'm a big fan of the idea of evidence-based pricing. You know, evidence-based medicine was the big Dr. David Eddy concept of the early 90s. It's a funny term because what other type of medicine is there? I hope it's evidence-based, you know. But um, I've added the, the term, you know, evidence-based pricing. So you go to Michelle, you do the study that she requires, you get FDA approval, then you come to me. We continue the, the task of designing a clinical trial and doing everything to get Aetna, Cigna, Medicare to sign off. And with that data, we're then going to go do a cost of, birth, uh, cost of illness analysis. Um, okay. uh, or the, what is the burden of chronic kidney disease because your product is for chronic kidney disease. So once we know that, then we can price your product based off the evidence. So it's a return on investment for society? So it would, be, it would be more, I take this 50 patients and this 50 patients, they get your device, they don't. And I go, look, they had 17 emergency room visits and five kidney transplants. But in your group that got this thing, they only had two and two. So this minus this plus this divided by this, all in the inpatient setting. So it's going to come out of the DRG. You should be charging $6,119 no more. Now, if board of directors will let you do a three-year long prospective study without knowing roughly what you're going to be charging, that's a different issue. The board's going to be like, you've got to pick a price now so that we know what your total addressable market is and we know what the market cap of the company is right now. And you can make up something in back of the envelope. We think we could charge four to five grand. You know, then you go do the study, then you do the health economics, and you go, man, given the benefit that we're providing to Aetna and Cigna, we could be charging $6,142.63, but we're going to be good and come in at four grand and leave a little something on the table that greases the tracks for coverage. So evidence-based pricing is a very smart way because you didn't just make up the price. You did it based off of the outcomes that a cohort of 50 and 50 patients could expect to achieve with your device. Right. Before Thank I ask you. Michelle for her perspective on that, Nick, I just sent you a quick note on Slack if you give that a look. Michelle, um, 
what what struck me is um, somewhat ironic in, in what you said before is your customers come to you and they're like, oh, 10, you know, I'm going to have to do these this relatively small number of things to get it through FDA. And they're like, oh, I'm in denial and grief. And uh, you may be counseling them. I guess you're not saying, you know, just wait till you leave my office. <laughs> it's baby, baby steps. Yeah. Um, it, well, and you know, people have trouble stomaching when I tell them that a 510K typically takes 80 to 120 hours to properly offer, uh, review and prepare the, the e-copy. And, uh, and they have trouble stomaching that. And I'm like, okay, this is like your shot at the FDA kind of uh, stamp. And, and you, you, you think it's going to take less than a reasonable effort of two total weeks to, 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 to do it properly? And so, like, what do you think that that conversation with, with Nick is going to be like early on if they think 80 hours to write a 510K is a lot? Our next contestant is Alan Cooper, who I'm now making a panelist because he has a question for you both. So um, instead of me reading it, Alan, show yourself and uh, let's see your question. Oh, it actually worked. Okay. Hi, <laughs> hey, Alan. Hey, Michelle. Hi. Uh, so this isn't asking for like any particular client, but I just find it to be an interesting area. So uh, with uh, with more precision medicine, sorry, you had brought up evidence-based medicine, so it got me interested to ask this question. So with a precision-based medicine solution, so if I wanted to develop a, let's say, a 3D printed custom hip uh, implant, and that was my product, what would be some insights to know on the regulatory side for how would I even go about getting that through the FDA? Because as far as I know currently, or I know that would be tricky to get to the FDA if it's custom 3D printed and then reimbursement side. I have no idea how that would work as far as with that product, you're not necessarily proving out the product because it's a custom process of creating the hip implant. So I was just curious what insights you had on that. Well, from a regulatory perspective, that's definitely an area where the FDA is still developing their kind of thinking and positioning on it. It would be super important to make sure you know not only any guidance documents that are already out, but any that are, are in draft, any maybe public workshops they might have had, just so you can get an idea of where their, their thinking is at uh, on that technology. Um, something fascinating, because I'm working with a 3D uh, um, dental implant that has been on the market for a long time in the EU because under the MDD, those didn't even require the uh, a, notif a technical file notified body uh, involvement. So it's hmm. recent, the, the regulation under MDR has recently changed, uh, and, but it still doesn't require the level of oversight that a 3D printed dental implant is going to require for the, for, for the U.S. Um, so, so that would be important to understand the regulatory strategy to be able to inform your marketing strategy. You know, uh, most of the time, you guys have heard me like, right now, just don't try to go to Europe because it's the reg regulatory wise is such a mess. But this is one of those kind of rare exceptions where it may make sense to explore Europe first, despite the MDD and MDR debacle. Um, yeah, you said something else that that I had a thought about that I can't. It, it's gone. It's past now. Well, if it comes back, interrupt. Um, so, on the reimbursement side, I, I usually say this about diagnostic tests, Alan. Where though you can more acutely treat, though you can more acutely diagnose, can you more acutely treat? You know, and that's kind of the whole game with precision medicine and personalized medicine and all these you know, 21st century idioms that have come about that, yes, I can, I can do a, I have the striker knee that I can pull off the shelf for total knee arthroplasty or hemi arthroplasty or total, you know, whatever total joint. And I'm going to get this outcome versus a 3D printed. And I'm going to get, if you can see, I'm going to get this outcome, you know, 
Well, from a reimbursement perspective, if you're going to get a good outcome, we would look at it and say, okay, have you done the clinical trials? Have you shown, you know, safety and efficacy and all that kind of stuff? Um, how much are you charging for this? Because maybe that much of an improvement is one month, or let, let's do six months of additional delaying of a revision surgery because of aseptic loosening. Well, six months pushing off an, an 85-year-old's total knee replacement is substantial. So um, maybe that 3D printed knee is actually worth something much uh, substantial, you know. Now, if, you're, if the total knee coming off the shelf is, you know, $10,000 and yours is $30,000 because it's precision medicine, well, you better be showing an additional, you know, $20,000 worth of benefit. So you better be shoving off the revision surgery by an extra five or ten years, not by six months. So precision medicine has been, it's, it's what we all want. I mean, CRISPR is precision medicine. You know, all these new things is precision medicine. But from a reimbursement standpoint, it can be a real letdown. Because you go, yes, I can give that guy exactly what he needs, but really, it doesn't make a big clinical difference in the end if I would have just given him the off-the-shelf standard thing we've used for the last 10 years. Well, and, and you just, I've mentioned that same word or, or term throughout this call, clinical benefit. You know, it, it, and this, this might be an area where FDA says, well, that's great. Maybe it's safe and effective, but we don't really perceive any clinical benefit. So what's the point? Let me interject first. Sue, uh, go ahead and add yourself with your webcam. And two, I'm thinking as it relates to evidence, I, I don't know how you would aggregate the evidence of every 3D printed customized experience versus what if I just gave them the Zimmer implant. Well, in that, what I would recommend is that if Alan's company, let's say it's, you know, hypothetical 3D printed knees or shoulders or whatever, do an RCT. Get, uh, get 50 patients, whatever the correct number, that have the off the shelf and then have Alan's company take another group of 50 patients that are going to have a TKA, total knee arthroplasty, and then compare the outcomes of the two after 48 months and go, look, those guys that got the 3D printed precision medicine total knee arthroplasty had 5% fewer of these, 22% fewer of those, and so on. And if you found equivalence, would, would a reimbursement agent yeah. say, you know what, there was no statistically significant difference, so why am I paying more for this? And That's therefore, I'm not going to support it anymore? Don't pay more. So that would be a cost minimization analysis, not a cost effectiveness analysis. And we would say Allen's knee is non-inferior to the standard of care. Non-inferiority is a fantastic commercial go-to-market strategy to say we are no worse than the standard of care, but by the way, we're 20% less expensive. So that's the, that would be a gut-wrenching decision for Allen, Allen's board of directors to go, dang it, we did the study and we're not, we don't have superior outcomes. Can we still do these 3D printed knees instead of $10,000? Can we do them for five? Undercut striker and go to market with a non-inferiority strategy. That, that could totally work. Hmm. Mr. FDA, do you have a... Well, listening to Nick and Michelle, you can understand why people don't pick regulatory or reimbursement for careers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, this is a question that has to do with the medical economics. Uh, it's it's obvious uh, from a reimbursement standpoint there are things important that aren't necessarily important to FDA. The question is, have you ever developed a protocol with a device company where you, Nick, have taken a look at it and said, okay, this the procedural cost, we need to get a better grasp on procedural costs and ancillary equipment, hospital stay, um, you know, read, you know, follow up, whatever, and and then have a study that's got clinical significant endpoints that satisfies FDA, but also has a lot of economic data in it to show that it's a, it's a good deal and should be reimbursed. Have you ever have done? Have you ever had input on a protocol design? Yeah, and in fact, I'm doing one as we speak, 
and just submitted one to a company just a few days ago. And it was exactly what you just described, Larry. And I spent four years on Intermountain Healthcare's Value Analysis Committee, the VAC. And we would, so I've been on the other side of the table too, where I'm the one reviewing this for Intermountain Healthcare going, not, not as a payer, I was also a payer, but on the hospital side of that job that I had for seven years, going, wait a minute, guys, you're selling us capital equipment and you're trying to price this and do health economics as though you're disposable, you know, and, and have some funny discussions. I mean, some of these roundtables were really kind of funny about these companies that had raised 50 million bucks and were missing the mark entirely. And so, sorry for the roundabout an answer, but yes, that if I had to sum up what most companies come to me for, it's to do exactly that and to say, look, will you work with our biostatistician and let's go pull the literature and make sure that we're hitting the endpoints that are going to be most significant to either the hospital or the insurance company, depending who our customer is. If it's capital equipment, it's the hospital. Thanks. Sue? Hi, uh, I had a question. If you have a, a new device, then and there are two predicate devices you're comparing it to for your 510k clearance, how do you, if you know, for reimbursement, how do you come up with a new code? So those, I, I see those as two separate things. So you're saying if, if you have a product, there's already a, when you say predicate, you're talking Michelle's language. I don't really care about predicates from a reimbursement standpoint, but I would say if there, if go to Alan Cooper's question and it, hypothetical technology of a total knee arthroplasty that's 3D printed, precision medicine designed just for you versus an off the shelf one, that the payer would do what's called an HTA, a health technology assessment, there's information like you wouldn't believe online about HTAs. Uh, there's HTA review organizations like NICE and Cochrane and Hayes and C. And they would look at the standard of care's data and say, what, do you, what is the standard outcome I could expect after a total knee arthroplasty at 36, 48, and 60 months? And they, you know, here's, here's what I expect on aseptic loosening and you know, uh, revision surgeries and so on. Now let's look at Sue's outcomes and we're going to compare those. So to use the term predicate, I know that you were just, you know, that that's the term in the regulatory world. In the reimbursement world, we just say standard of care. So the standard of care would be the off the shelf total knee that Stryker and Medtronic have been making for a million years. Uh, and how does your technology compare to the outcomes we would expect to get from that? And if you go do that study and you see that you're non-inferior, meaning you're equivalent, you're just as good as them, then you better charge less. So you have a good cost utilization and cost minimization analysis. If you're more expensive and you're not as good, you're dead in the water. What if you're better? If you're better, go ahead and charge a few more bucks. You know, and that's where... You have to have, the data. You have, to have the data in the healthcare economy study to prove it. Right, right. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Domino, our well-appointed friend. You know what I especially loved is when you got on camera, your your tie was off just a little bit. <laughs> it's a, it's a mirror. So the call is a mirror for yourself as well, so I saw the tie. Uh, but this question actually is for Nick. Uh, Nick, what if there's what would be your reimbursement plan for a a device, a therapeutic device, which has had a 510K since 2008, but is now and was primarily used in elective surgeries, but now is being more used in uh, non-elective surgeries where hospitals are using it more widely, where now they're looking for reimbursement. But unfortunately, it doesn't have a specific HICSPIX code. So I would start there. Um, you know, we, we'd have to, I'd have to know a little bit more about exactly what the technology is. I, I don't know that it would make too much of a difference off the top of my head about it being elective versus non-elective surgery. Um, it would be the essentially the indications for use. A, again, another Michelle, more of a Michelle term, 
you know, what was it initially reimbursed for? You know, if it was reimbursed for appendectomy, uh, emergency appendectomies or something, and insurance companies have been paying, and now if they're pivoting, no, that wouldn't be an elective surgery. Man, that's a bad now, example. Well, I'll, I'll give you the example. It's, it was primarily used, it's a, a non-invasive therapy device for reducing pain. The indication is for reduction of pain and edema in post-operative tissue. So in plastic surgery, those are all elective procedures, and there's been thousands and thousands of uses in plastic surgery. But now recently, since it reduces the need for opioids, it's being used in operatives, uh, operations, uh, you know, such as C-sections and others, which are, you know, not elective. So the, the question is, how now do you go about getting reimbursement for now these uses? Yeah, that's a brilliant question. That, that helps that clarification. So, again, it would be proving it. I, it's, so pain reduction is a really tricky, tricky thing. I, that is a, I've worked with a couple of companies that have, you know, analgesic type, uh, like uh, infusion pumps and things like that. And that's hard because the showing the clinical utility and health economics of reducing pain in the post-operative setting is, is very difficult. Well, let me, let me just, if I could just interject, there was an RCT that was done and published in peer-reviewed journal, which showed a 200% reduction in the use of post-operative pain medications in the treated versus the sham group. So in that, then at that point, I would say your customer is the hospital because pain medications are cheap. An insurance company is going to be like, look, a, a, you know, a shot of this or a shot of that after surgery is cheap. It's already bundled in the APC grouper, the, the bundled bill or the DRG. Right. Uh, it doesn't come out of our pocket. It comes out of them, out of their pocket. Go ask them to reimburse you, meaning you have, your customer at that point would be the hospital's value analysis committee. It's not going to be the payer. So you'd have to go to them and, and make that argument to them because after a, a total shoulder, um, you know, say a same day surgery, uh, hemiarthroplasty or something like that, they're gonna the patient's gonna show up for surgery at 8 a.m. They're gonna have the surgery at 10. They're gonna be in post op until four o'clock, and they're gonna be home by dinner. Well, all of that is gonna be bundled into one bill, ten thousand bucks. Period. That's what the insurance company is gonna see. Now, if your company has a pain reduction thing that's gonna eat. $20 out of that or $200 out of that bundled bill, the insurance company goes, look, we don't really care. Very rarely do we care. Um, go talk to the ambulatory surgical center. Go talk to the hospital outpatient department. They're your customer. If they're willing to eat that $200 out of their bundled bill, they can knock themselves out. Got it. Okay, understood. So you, you wouldn't need insurance. This would be a this would be an issue between you and the value analysis committee. Okay, I wanted thanks. to uh, bring Lee Stein on. He's our newest friend in the group. And uh, if you don't mind me saying so, he's a pretty big deal and he's working on something exciting. So I definitely wanted him to meet the two of you at least. Lee, would you introduce yourself to the group? Thank you. Um, some of that was overstated. So, but thank you for that introduction. He's a medium-sized deal, fine. Um, uh, I, uh, my background is I am, I'm a trustee of something called the X Prize Foundation. For any of you who have seen large prizes in operation, I'm also on the University of California, San Diego uh, Medical Advisory Board, and also on the Science and Technology Subcommittee, um, chaired by Erwin uh, Jacobs, whose name is on the hospital as the founder of Qualcomm. And I spent 14 years on the Scripps Health Foundation Board. We've run a number of family, most of what I've done over the last 20 years has been philanthropic. Uh, we spent the last, uh, however, um, the family story is, is that uh, every member of my family, including me, has had a medical problem that was deemed to be life altering and incurable. And um, all of us are doing quite well. Most of the stories are published. And we have become fans of doing N of one IRB research, um, the N being one person in the study. And while it's statistically irrelevant, um, it wasn't irrelevant to us uh, in order to add medical discipline and protocols around family medical processes. Um, we had the resources to escalate it to that level of IRB. So um, we're a big fan of IRB research. 
And um, I'm here today because uh, on one of my uh, family members, my youngest son, um, we had to invent our way out of his health problem. And that has turned into a device that we are now looking to take to market. Uh, we've run about 3,600 people through the system already. Um, and uh, um, we're adding more and more components to it every day. And we're now out of my league. So welcome to the world of Joe Haig. <laughs> so would you tell us a bit about it and its regulatory status? The fact that you've run 3,600 people through it, is this still a trial? Do you have clearance to sell the thing? Uh, we don't have clearance uh, to sell it. We basically have two levels of the technology. One is what I call the dumbed down version of it. But basically we use uh, 20, we were, we're basically using uh, FCC class one sensors uh, to digitize the exterior of the body. Uh, Non-invasive, we don't touch anyone. We're using 20 sensors, grab about 3 million data points, knock that, pick up landmarks on the body, pick up 357 different specific measurements and reduce that down to 44 different conditions right now. Um, and uh, that all happens within four seconds. And um, we are, we have not done regulatory. We are not making really any claims with it. We're just looking at the body posture, shape, shift tilts and rotations. Um, and then when we see anomalies in the body with all those measurements, uh, we're able to correlate that back to medically validated um, um, exercises in order to deal with postural alignment. The medical theory is quite simple. If your cars misalign, the tires wear. If the tires wear long enough, the bearings wear. Knee replacement, hip replacement, lower back and neck, um, unless they originate from a car accident falling off the ladder, or another traumatic event are basically postural misalignments um, so that some can be avoided. There's predictive analytics in it, but we have a, um, a very simple system that we're using right now as a wellness product. And we have the more sophisticated system that we've built now that we have thousands of bodies that have run through our system. So. That's where we are. Regulatory, we're at the starting line. Michelle, thoughts? Yep. So, uh, Lee, you're in a fascinating regulatory space because there's this whole continuum of regulatory options of how to bring your product to market based off of how you position your intended use. And, you know, you already touched on the kind of the general wellness. It's like, okay, how can you narrow in on uh, claims and product positioning that fit cleanly within how the FDA has defined that category. And then as you layer in indications, it's a possibility maybe we can find a reasonable predicate to make a, a argument for a 510K. Uh, and then as you continue to add features to your products, uh, specifically some of the predictive diagnostics and maybe uh, some AI uh, algorithms, you could also uh, get into a, a de novo space. Um, so we put together strategies regularly that kind of help customers scope their intended use and positioning of their product and layer in these levels of regulatory complexity uh, as the, the, the product matures and the company starts making more money off of the, the base platform. Great. That's exactly. Thank you very much for that observation. And too, I, I would just like to say too. I, I have cervical dystonia, so I um, can appreciate what the the implications of of the health problems that that posture and misalignment can can cause. Well, thank you. It was it was quite a journey. Uh, it was one of these. Spencer had an incidental finding. He had a sports injury where he fractured his back in four places, and it was the luckiest day of his life because when they did the MRI, they found a cavernous angioma at T4. Um, wow. And uh, we, in order to basically get a closer look at it, we initiated a IRB N of one study 
with a 7 Tesla magnet in 2011. The cage had not been yet invented to do the data acquisition on the spinal cord, but there was, uh, on the spine, but there was one um, uh, device in the United States at the time, which was a Siemens device at NYU Lagone Biomedical Engineering. So we helped them accelerate the invention of the cage so that we could do the data acquisition. He's the first person who had ever, um, um, he's the first person who had ever had a seven Tesla study of the spinal cord. And what happened is we found, and this I'll talk to you because of the medical sophistication on this call, and Joe, cut me off whenever I've exceeded the window you wanted. You're doing fine. You're doing okay. fine. Um, Only when the other five people are yawning, that's when you'll know. And I, and I don't know how to bring up screen sharing to show you what a 7 Tesla image of the spine looks like. But we had a very, um, um, I can do that on Zoom, by the way. But um, I we, can give uh, you the power. Do you want the screen? Um, let, me, let me make one. We found that... Um, there was distortion around the cavernoma. Um, they could see the clarity was spectacular, but there was some distortion, and the, they, they had never seen it before. And um, the reason that it became so interesting is that meant that, the, that it was wet and leaked, and some of the, the way that it works is that if you have blood and internal bleed, the blood will get reabsorbed, but the uh, uh, iron in the blood is called hemosiderin, would get stained the tissue. Nobody had ever seen seven Tesla magnet hit iron with that level of precision before. And because we had distortion outside of the cavernoma, the decision was made to take a, you know, 60% surgical risk of paralysis, um, or it was 40 to 80% chance of paralysis. Um, because the, because of what we saw with this N of one study, so we've uh, we've got some track record here. Um, he ended up in neuro rehab, having to learn how to walk again, and every time he went to see a physical therapist, inpatient neuro rehab at first for pretty dark places, and then every time we went to see a physical therapist, there were or another doctor, there was another recommendation. We couldn't get any consistency. Of, um, of what he should be doing for uh, disorienting chronic pain. And we, in poking around the concept of working on posture matter, but there was no way to see your body. The photograph really didn't show him what his posture was, but there was equipment that could be bought off the shelf that could do that. So we just started tinkering and dissecting the body from the outside. Wow. Um, Anyway, that's the background of that story. Thank you, Joe, for the opportunity to share that. My pleasure. Nick, your thoughts on how to reimburse for something like that? Yeah, so um, the I, first question is, would you want to be reimbursed? Is this something where you would, again, like I said, would you want to even play this game? Or would this be something where, um, like a Smile Direct Club, you know, where patients who want to pay for this out of pocket can, maybe they can use their HSA account. Um, if you say no, you know, our, we know definitively that our customer is Aetna, Cigna, Blue Cross, Medicare, and so on, then we have to play this big, long game. And it can be very frustrating, but it can be incredibly lucrative at the end because you go, guys, we are not uh, hocus pocus. We're not, we did incredibly well-conducted studies. We showed a demonstrable improvement in, in patient outcomes. So, Lee, this is one point that I've made in the past is the difference between clinical validity and clinical utility. And I put my hands on different levels for that reason because clinical validity is usually what gets physicians jazzed. You know, sensitivity, specificity, positive and negative predictive value, uh, it's all logical, right? If I can more acutely diagnose, I can more acutely treat. Clinical utility is the next step up that essentially answers the question, who cares? So if I could do this total body imaging type thing, is if I can summarize it that way, what you've described, Lee, the question in the end is, who cares? What, what clinical improvement is measured 
is captured that has a an, a, an adjoining cost associated with it. So if I do your program, if I do that imaging thing, and I get an improvement in a clinical outcome that I otherwise couldn't have obtained, then yeah, you want to go for reimbursement. Aetna and Cigna and all of them are going to do backflips over it. But if this is a uh, clinical validity technology, that's a different issue. And you may want to just sell direct to um, direct to consumer or start a series of clinics that do this, like CT calcium scoring. That's a very good example of a potential type product like this. Lee, what are we looking at here? Um, on the right, you're looking at Spencer touching the touch screen within the cage. And on the left, uh, we have an overproduced portable unit, um, which is inside of that glass truck, so that um, we can take it portably wherever we want to go. Um, but we wanted to do it in a way that people did not have to be concerned about what vehicle they were stepping into and what it would look like. So we can close it. With, people can close it with curtains by themselves if they want. Um, uh, to do the scanning, but so we use that as our uh, as both a showroom as well as uh, we take it to health fairs in um, underserved uh, communities. And Are there do, other places on this soon-to-be redesigned site that I should go to? Um, no, the kinds of things that you would want to show everybody, they're not on the they're not on the site. I mean, we did have a very we did have a very OS 7 tell Tesla if, images of the sign. Yeah, Michelle? If you are redoing the site, we need to make sure that all the verbiage is consistent with the regulatory strategy and sure. the way that you're positioning it on the website doesn't automatically make it a medical device if you don't sure. already have it. We, we, we appreciate that advice. We've had both Epstein, Becker, Green, and Morrison Forrester uh, do that for us. Um, so that we had one do it, and then we had a second one do it, just to make sure that the first one didn't make any mistakes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, three lawyers. Yeah. Um, and so, um, but we would appreciate an additional review as well, so we can have that discussion. We're more than happy. We did have a very interesting uh, situation where we were um, uh, taking it somewhere, and the, the question that came up. Um, was dealing with the fact that we're what we're using is FCC class one um, lasers um, and they're basically the same laser that's in a Microsoft Connect different manufacturer but the same FCC class certification so they are um, deemed by the FCC as not regulatory um, so it's, Video video game class of uh, analysis at this point. We'll uh, we'll call it here, and I'd love to have you take a Friday, and and we can go in in great depth. I'll sure. also invite uh, folks of every discipline on the call. If you had an idea or a brainstorm or something that you think you can help Lee expedite his path to commercialization, just leave a note either here to me or he is on Slack now, so you can just go find Lee Stein and, and type my note. My patient friend, Alan Cooper, has a follow-up question from before. Alan? Alan needs to unmute himself. Oh, was that my fault? That's not my fault. You're self-muted. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Sorry, took a couple of clicks to make it happen. Uh, so my other follow-up question was just another kind of general one and one that I kind of had interest in. So uh, for off-label use of a medical device, uh, I was curious some of the maybe warnings and recommendations you might have on the regulatory side as well as on the, uh, I'm actually, I have no idea how that works on the reimbursement side because obviously like off-label use of medical devices happens I'm curious how that would work as far as like, you know, are they, it seems like they wouldn't do that if they weren't getting paid for it in some kind of way. <laughs> uh, but uh, I just thought that might be an interesting topic that falls in between those two areas. Well, from the regulatory perspective, um, you know, the FDA can't regulate the, the actual practice of medicine. 
They have no say over the physician, say or control over the physician and how they use things. Um, the problem would get into once, you know, a physician may be told a sales rep, hey, I just did this thing with your device or your product, even though you're indicated for something else and it worked, it had wild success. And then that, that, that sales rep goes and starts telling all the physicians to use it off-label. Then, then, then all of a sudden, now the company is marketing the product for the off-label juice. And that's where the FDA would, would intervene is when it's the company that's promoting the off-label use. Um, but that, that, again, is uh, going to be a, a change in indication and require a new 510K and maybe a de novo depending on how novel what they're doing with it is. Yep. From a reimbursement standpoint, it would be almost requisite for the company to start over again. That they'd say, we have now, again, like a label, when we use that term, that's a regulatory term, not a reimbursement term, that we would say, okay, doctor, what do you want to do? We being Cigna or Medicare or whatever, and you know, Dr. Smith comes to us and says, hey, I want, this thing has been approved for multiple myeloma, but I found that it works really good for ingrown toenails. I want to use it for that. And I still want to bill for $1,000 for it. And we go, okay, go give us the data. Habeas corpus on that randomized prospective multi-centered study. I need it in an NAMCP clinical dossier. I need evidence of clinical utility and clinical validity. Health economics would be fantastic. And the doctor goes, wait, what? And we go, yeah, if you're billing a CPT code for ingrown toenail removal and you're billing a HICPIX code for this thing, those don't work together. We have it set up for multiple myeloma in CPT and HICPIX, but we don't have it for ingrown toenail in that particular HICPIX code. It's going to be automatically denied. The computer system here at Aetna will automatically deny it. It won't even, human eyeballs won't even see that. But when you get that CPT and that HICPIX code, they're going to clash, and it's going to be denied. And then you have to go through the appeals process. Every state in the United States has usually three levels of appeals. And they'll say, dang it, I know what I'm doing. This works fantastic for ingrown toenail removal. And we go, "How do you, do you have evidence for that? I've, I've been on PubMed for six weeks trying to find anything, and I can't find any evidence. So denied yet again. Um, that's that's how we would look at uh, as you as you would call Alan like a label, is show us that that what you're doing works. Hmm. So there would be a possibility of somebody having done some type of study with a device that may not be the intended use that could potentially get reimbursed but not have the interesting. Hmm. Yeah. So I we would just say you know let's say for example this company does you know hear back from Dr. Smith, who's on one of their key opinion leaders or he's on their medical advisory board or whatever, and he says, you guys will never believe that this works so well, not just for multiple myeloma, but for ingrown toenails. That's where the Michelle Lott working for this company would be like, hold on, time out, start over, regulatory approval for that. Then the market access person, me, would step in and say, okay, here's the trial we need to do to show in 10,000 ingrown toenails you know that it that it works and say you you don't you'd essentially have to start over. Hmm. Jan, if you'd add your camera, please. I added you because I have a question for you. Hmm. So, uh, Lee Jan Gates is my go-to person for packaging, and she taught us that packaging is part of the medical device, and I typically think of that as something in a pouch or something in a box. When we're talking about a huge piece of capital equipment like Lee's, what is packaging? Um, normally that would be in a crate of some type and shipped by, um, you know, a fork truck putting it on a truck and sent somewhere. That's packaging. Actually, if right here, I was going to send him an email later and say, what have you done for your shock and vibration work on um, this truck or is this truck abnormal compared to what delivery trucks would be like because you can easily uh, break something or shake screws out or bend something and it might not work so I think that 
it, and Lee, you can answer straight away. I, I don't think of this as the way he delivers product. This is him like being like a, a blood bank and going around to different neighborhoods. Right, but we can get some information from that and what he's done and, and how those springs are to develop what kind of packaging would work best for him, what kind of block and bracing you might have to have or if you even need it. Something in a crate. Oh, I like me. Medical grade testing, shake and bake that you're going to teach us in a few weeks? I, I can answer that. Um, in that particular application, and that's sort of the prototype application, um, it is uh, every, every piece, everything inside is so solid state, and we just recalibrate every time we open the door. Hmm. And recalibration takes about three and a half minutes, four minutes. So, so the machines you're going to sell are going to be solid state like that too? Yeah. But well, we're not going to sell them. We're not going to sell the machines. We're going to provide the equipment and provide the service. It's really about the software in the cloud. We're, in many respects, uh, the intention is to be hardware agnostic. Um, when you start looking at this category of 3D sensors, um, when you start looking at this category of 3D sensors, you're, um, because of three industrial 3D printing, autonomous cars, drone cameras, augmented reality, virtual reality. There's a whole lot of people inventing chips that are going to get faster and faster and cheaper and cheaper without us having to be in the R&D business. And then, but as long as our software can um, basically take any type of 3D input, um, we just, then, then we're looking forward to these devices getting smaller and smaller. Eventually we expect it to be in a form factor similar to your iPhone. Uh, but that's just a generation or two away. And you do know that they test iPhones for three to four months in laboratories before they actually send them out, just to make okay. sure they don't have shock and vibration, touch point issues, or like I, said, like I said, we're going to be hardware agnostic, and we look forward to the, all the manufacturers testing their stuff appropriately. You know, we're just we're just going to valid, validate that we can grab the landmarks that we want off of their equipment. Hmm. Be interesting. So we'd have to work with the people because I work with the physical products and don't worry too much about the rest of it. Yeah, and we're we're basically seeming that the physical products we're we're, we're somewhat agnostic to it. That field seems to be to us. Maybe this is wrong but it's moving so, so quickly with so many large, large players that we're more than happy to be a customer of their R&D. Yeah, we just got to find the, the people to make sure that it can actually function properly on your, with yeah. your software. So far, so good. Okay, uh, thank you for that. And uh, let us conclude where we began with our friends, Nick and Michelle. So some, some closing thoughts from my perspective, and I think that they're gonna kind of make it a full circle back to the start of our conversation where we were talking about the codes, is uh, I see people who are doing their own research and they're getting themselves in trouble uh, by thinking that they understand the regulatory and reimbursement role, that they picked the right codes in my world and the right codes in Nick's world. And I hope that if, if anything people have learned today that both of these worlds are so complex and, and they do kind of ebb and flow in and out of each other that they really do need some support to understand, pick the right things for their product and the right things for their business strategy. Um, and they, 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 need, they need expert advice to help navigate both of those worlds. I think my concluding thought is, you know, it's Michelle just said it by saying that it's complex. It is complex. This is the most nuanced industry that I could ever fathom being in. If somebody were to say, Nick, I have this thing and we've been using it in the inpatient setting for, you know, heart transplantation, that's one business thing. Using the exact same product to implant in somebody's ear for you know 
tinnitus or something like that is a whole entirely different reimbursement, health economics, market access, CPT, HICPICS, nightmare, but it's the same device. All you've done is moved from one setting of care to another. Um, the vernacular of incremental cost effectiveness ratios and quality adjusted life years and CPT and HICPICS and all this kind of stuff, it, it's dizzying and no fewer than probably 10 times a week do I get a cold sweat, and I've been doing this a long time, where it's like, man, I don't know, that's a weird one. <laughs> you want to use this in this setting, but da da da. You know, Michelle, it's like you, you're always second guessing yourself, you know? Yeah, well, you said that a uh, cold sweat. I get panicked for my customers, and they don't even know that they should be panicked. I know, and I. <laughs> so, my. Have anxiety for you. <laughs> Yeah, this is nuanced. It is really intricate. The answers to these questions are really difficult, but um, reimbursement and regulatory without one or the other, uh, you have to have Michelle, question, no question asked. You may need me. If you're going to be on aisle six at Walgreens, you probably don't really need me. I can help you do some health economic stuff, whatever, but you don't have to do it. You need me if you need absolute reimbursement. If you want to play the three-year-long game with Aetna, Cigna, United Healthcare, and all of that, that's where I come in. But you absolutely have to have Michelle one way or another. If you're a medical device making a claim of some sort, you have to have Michelle and you might need me. We were going to conclude here, but we have a last-minute entry from Nathan, and uh, this question's important, so if you'll indulge. Nathan, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Nick, you mentioned early on uh, trying to start a small-scale FDA trial at the same time as a larger multi-center randomized control trial for health outcomes. And it seems like those are two separate funding rounds. So how do you, I mean, would you try to convince investors to fund those at the same time? Or no. it seems I, like two different milestones. Can't you use yeah. some of Michelle's work as the first hundred people for your work? Yes. And have to count twice? Yes. And what I would highly recommend, Nathan, that's, that's a very good question. What you're doing is you're priming your board and you're getting them ready that when Michelle tells us we need to spend $100,000 to do this study, we're then going to have to do a $5 million study that Nick says. I'm just warning you, dear board of directors right now, don't you dare come back and be like, we already gave you 100 grand. We thought that was enough. You got FDA. Go sell this thing to Aetna. So what I'm saying is just prep your board of directors that they don't throw a fit when, they then, when you then come back and go, okay, we've got FDA. Now we need to go get reimbursement, and I need an additional $2 million, $5 million, $10 million. And they go, we know. You prepped us for that two years ago. You know, That's what I'm saying. And you can... And furthermore, the research and the study you would do with Michelle will help you craft what you're going to do with me. And you'll go, Nick, we learned a ton during that FDA trial, and we made some tweaks. We figured out we're not so good in, you know, patients under the age of 30 for whatever reason. You know, I'm glad we learned that on the 100-patient study rather than on the 1,000-patient study we're going to do with you. Okay. So it's not necessarily that you're raising the money for it. You, when you go out and you do a Series A or even some, some serious seed funding to do the work you need to do with Michelle, you're just prepping everybody and you're saying, guys, this is to get regulatory, which is absolutely necessary, but we also think we need to get reimbursement. That's going to be an order of magnitude more expensive. I'm just warning you now. And then you don't have any board of directors members getting mad at you. Thank you, and thank you, Nick. Uh, I think that concludes our show for today. Uh, we've never gone past 90 minutes, and we're hovering at 87 and a half, and I knew we would go all the way to the end because uh, each of you could fill 90 minutes, and, uh, well, the two of you together was a grand experiment, but let's hear it from Michelle and Nick, ladies and gentlemen. They're all a whole interwebs just... <laughs> So, Nick, we got to get you a mug and a house. And a house. Yeah, let's start with the house. And one. 
thanks everyone for joining us today. Special thanks to Michelle and Nick. I'll see you online. See you later. Thank you. Bye.